Good evening, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to you all, both here in Accra and online around the world. Tonight is incredibly special for us at the just-launched African Futures Institute, the AFI. Not only do we get to introduce ourselves via the first lecture of the season, but we also get to do it through two outstanding African women, Alero Olympio, in whose memory this particular lecture series is given, and Mariam Kamara, who was the unanimous choice when we began thinking about this series a few months ago. I'd also like to take a moment um, before we start to remember Alero's sister, the brilliant, funny, gifted and complex Natasha Olympio, who would have been the first to champion this initiative. This event is bittersweet for many of us in the room, but I think everyone will also agree that it's long overdue. Although we do have an anonymous, anonymous, I can never say that word, donor for this particular talk, I'd like to thank both the Ford Foundation and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for the support that makes the AFI possible. The AFI is a new kind of institute. It is both a public event platform, which begins now, and an academic program, which will begin in 2022. The next nine months are devoted exclusively to putting on lectures, talks, films, seminars, and discussions around architecture. I have to say that we're a tiny organization, and I'd like to thank everyone on the team, Kofi Esalapia, Yao Kankambuedu, Anthony Warchem, Ruth Ann Richardson, Ruth Deza, Eric Ojolik, who came all the way from New York, Michelle Kessler, and Victor Saki, who have worked around the clock over this past month, but particularly in these last few days. Our filmmakers, Maoli and Festus Jackson, who's here, and of course, Binta, Judith, and Zainab of the Mixed Design Hub, which is where we're holding the event. Our next lecture will be on September 15th, and it will be held here, and then we move into our own permanent space just up the road. Over the past week, for those of you who follow us on Instagram, you'll have seen a mosaic campaign featuring quotes and words from a number of people around the world remembering and honoring Alero Olympio. I'm not going to read them out tonight, but I would like to read a very short statement from two of the people that she held most dear. Dr. John Ennis and Morag Stocks, both of whom are watching from Edinburgh right now. We are here to celebrate Alero and the causes that she passionately championed. African architecture, sustainable building methods and support for women at the heart of the design and building process. In the 1990s, Alero and John formed a small company which acquired a brick-making machine and land to create houses in what was then a newly designated residential area in Accra. The land was of laterite, and trained teams dug foundations and used the mud to make bricks and build the houses. An echo of adobe architecture from former times. In a city enthralled to expensive imported concrete and a Western aesthetic, the project demonstrated that a more sustainable, locally resourced approach could enable contemporary design. Though Alero's untimely death from cancer prevented further work, the deeper message persists. There is a different way, an African way, a way that draws on older, local wisdom and walks more lightly on the earth. We miss Alero very much. Her smile and infectious laughter reached us across the years. She lived her life joyfully, kindly, courageously, determined to make a difference, to make things better. Her passion for sustainability and low-impact design resonates increasingly in this troubled world. In 2017, we contributed to a new design center in Alero's name, and I'm delighted that Renee is here with us at the Kokrae Institute, one of her first projects in Ghana. We are delighted that Alero's wisdom is now remembered and recognized through this memorial lecture series. Thank you to the AFI, and thank you to Mariam Kamara. On to tonight's speaker, Mariam. When I was preparing this short introduction this morning, I went into my files, since I've introduced Mariam a number of times over the past few years, and it's always good to reread what you read or spoke. Coincidentally, although I don't believe in coincidences anymore, she came to Johannesburg to lecture at the Graduate School of Architecture almost two years ago to the day. At the time, I introduced her by saying, you couldn't possibly have made her up. She's a former software engineer from Niger, 
US educated. She splits her time between Miami and the US. She has built significant projects, numerous competitions and awards, and is still just getting started. It's now two years later, and in that time, she won the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Award and the Prince Charles Award. She's completing projects across West Africa and the Middle East. Her practice is made up of young architects from Togo, Malawi, Zambia, South Africa, Senegal. She explores Niger's rich architectural legacy for inspiration, not so much reinterpreting traditions, but rather learning from them to see which lessons might still apply today. As she herself has said, architecture itself cannot make a more equitable world, but we can contribute with specific actions. And although I'm deeply interested in her work for its social, political, cultural, and aesthetic resonance, I'm equally fascinated by the story of the private and personal journey of an African woman architect exploding onto the international stage with talent and a growing reputation, and how the telling of that story influences and inspires those who hear it. So please welcome the Alero Olympia Memorial Lecture 2021 speaker, Mariam Kamara, to the AFI. Thank you so much, Leslie. This was quite an introduction. <laughs> I don't really know how to follow up on that, but um, first just let me say how much I appreciate you know, you're giving me this opportunity to, we were just talking about earlier how all of my lectures have been outside of the continent except for a couple in South Africa. But this is the first one outside of South Africa on the continent and I thank you for that. This is very special for me. And, and please you have to bear with me because as Leslie, as, as I've been telling Leslie, I've never been more nervous because this is home, right? And this one just make, it means so much more. So thank you all for coming. And I particularly appreciate also being invited to give this lecture, you know, under, you know, almost the spirit of Alero Olympio. Um, it's incredibly humbling. Um, I definitely feel a kindred spirit, you know, of sorts and also incredible pressure, obviously. Um, but I think as short as her life was, you know, the impact, and I'm so happy that you're bringing it to life, you know, for all to, to know um, and to learn from, the impact will resonate, you know, for years and years more to come. And I'm incredibly excited that this will also be recurring. Because it is important, we do not have enough examples or legends that we can point to, that we can speak about, and that we can really hold up and say, yes, this is actually, these are the people, these are our icons, these are our, you know, the people that we look to for inspiration and for guidance, rather than, as you pointed out, looking always to the West and looking for, you know, to other masters that have been elevated. There are masters, no questions, but we have masters too. So thank you for that as well. I think what, what I thought was the most appropriate um, for this lecture was to talk about sustainability. Um, not so much because sustainability is what we're all talking about. We, I think we would all agree that we're kind of in trouble right now um, as a planet. Also because that was something that was incredibly important to Alero, but it is something that is um, pervasive in every single project that I've ever undertaken and every every approach, every concept, every, you know, building that, I've, that I design. And so it's something that I don't talk about necessarily directly always, but it's always there. Um, so I thought this was a good opportunity to just, you know, talk about it, you know, directly in a pointed way. Um, I think often when we talk about sustainability, we're always thinking about obviously, you know, what's happening with the planet, the environment, you know, being in so much trouble, all of the different um, extreme, weather events we're experiencing, you know, from the droughts to the floods to, you know, you name it, um, earthquakes, you know, all of that. But then um, 
one of the, the things I think often that we don't realize, especially when you're not in the building industry or when you're not architects, you know, as architects and as builders, we are massive culprits, you know, of, of this, um, of what's happening to the planet because of the industrial materials that we're using, you know, the construction industry single-handedly is the third most polluting industry in the world. But that's not even counting the materials. The materials themselves come at number six. So we're no, it, really, if you mix those two together, we might be actually the number one polluter you know, on the planet. And I think as designers and as architects, this is something we should take incredibly seriously. As much as we you know, kind of um, talk about it and gloss over it and talk about you know, all the solar panels that we're going to put up on roofs you know, and all of these different um, sustainable approaches or even you know, try to have sustainable concrete or you know, whatever else we try to do, at the end of the day, we can do so much more. We can do so much more in terms of how we build. We can do so much more in terms of how we shape spaces rather than always just relying on you know, more technology again. Because at the end of the day, you know, those solar panels are great and they're important and we have to have them, but they also have to get fabricated. They also actually are an industry as well. They also, their production has a footprint as well. So while they're necessary, they cannot be the end-all, be-all of what we think of as sustainability, obviously. And for me, it's been particularly, I think, in a way easier to approach these notions because I practice, or I started practicing, you know, in Niger first, and where there is just incredible scarcity. And we don't have, solar panels are very expensive, um, concrete is very expensive, it's incredibly hot, 45 degrees, you know, so this is very pleasant. Um, and so there's just this automatic um, situation where you have to be very careful how you put things together. You do have to be careful what materials you use, otherwise you create, you make a building made out of concrete, say, and you go inside, it's 45 outside, but it's 50 inside of that building, which means then you need, even your air conditioner it will probably break trying to cool that down. And so imagine what that means in terms of energy consumption, what that means in terms of cost also. Because one of the things that I started realizing working in this context was that sustainability is not just about actually the environment. It's about also how you sustain people and their lives and economies and cultures. One of the things that happened with the pervasive use of concrete is that so it freed everyone you know, to make all kinds of forms and you know, to quickly build and cheaply build, but we sacrificed something incredibly important, which was cultural identity for the most part. Because as much as you, know, we, you can technically make any form you want, but one of the things that happens, as we all know, you know in the 20th century, after colonization and all that, um, all of us started thinking that being modern and being contemporary meant going with a certain aesthetic. And unless you do that, then somehow you're still backward, right? So the local materials get left behind. But meanwhile, we have serious problems and serious challenges on our hands. You know, we have flights from countryside because of droughts, you know, again, climate change, which means that our cities are gonna be, are gonna have to be able to accommodate a lot more people. We need housing, we need, you know, they're just, the list goes on and on and on. And so then to me, it's imperative actually that we are very, very worried um, and that we take this much more seriously than we currently do. Um, whether it's because of the materials that we use, which would allow to build much more cheaply. So again, economic sustainability on top of the environmental ones, whether it's in the way that we form our spaces to help nurture you know, um, communities, to you know, really empower the people who use the spaces that we use, which is a form of cultural sustainability in terms of really actually salvaging you know, our heritage, um, which is our identity, but then the identity has a lot to do with how we present ourselves in the world and how confident we are in the world. If we say that what we're, what we're building needs to be in the image of someone else. Because that someone else somehow is, I guess, some kind of god or something who you know, knows everything and is better at everything than us. This is a catastrophic problem for our future. 
and essentially this is how we approach the world, right? And so this kind of cultural aspect is one of the ones that I, I kind of um, attach on the most outside of the environmental one. Um, because I grew up in an environment where you know, the architecture, the traditional architecture of, this, of the place is incredibly rich, so I was incredibly fortunate also. Um, and I've been able to work on projects and develop projects such as this one, which is a, a community center in a village in Niger that was both a new building but also an adaptive use um, project, sorry. An adaptive reuse project where we had an old mosque um, in a village that was supposed to be destroyed, but it was kind of this quintessential example of traditional architecture that we tried to save and refurbish, turned it into a library, and then created a new mosque next, next to it that would accommodate um, the needs of the village. But one of the things um, that we encountered immediately was, you know, what should this mosque look like? One of the things that are happening Niger being a Muslim country, we do, again, the same, the same thing that we do with Western architecture, we also do with so-called Islamic architecture, meaning that all of our mosques now look like Middle Eastern mosques, which have nothing to do with our local identity. So it really goes on and on in, in different ways. But we were able, through some research, to find you know, examples of you know, 17th century mosques and try to learn from that and how the spaces are organized and how you know, the sequences of you know, how you go through the mosque, how you pray and you know, how you separate the different spaces and then make a kind of 21st century you know, interpretation or version of that, you know, if you will. And so um, something that we were incredibly fortunate to do was to try to figure out how to take some of the spirit of the previous mosque that we were refurbishing but create something more contemporary something that could stand the test of time, something that didn't require as much maintenance, which is a problem, um, considering that most of the populations now do no longer know how to you know, maintain clay architecture, you know, build with um, a certain level of maintenance that you know, needs to be renewed yearly. So rather than fighting that, it was more about acknowledging that and trying to figure out, okay, so maybe instead of using clay, we should use compressed earth bricks, which don't really require as much maintenance. And then because we needed these really, really tall spaces, we can use concrete you know, in the areas that make sense and then create a, some, some kind of hybrid system. But we quickly came across a problem. You know, some of this kind of hybridity requires skill. And one, one thing that we realized is that you think all the skills come from the more contemporary you know, builders you know, and all that, but we quickly found out that when we need to merge the two systems, our contemporary contractors didn't know how to do it, and then our traditional masons didn't know how to deal with the concrete situation. And so it was this amazing learning experience where we created these hybrid teams also for building, where we learn from each other, and then we have traditional masons making these domes you know, that they know how to do, but that the you know, more like evolved contractors had no idea. They made these formworks you know, to make um, these structures that completely were misshapen and literally looked like they were going to collapse. Meanwhile, the traditional masons just like jumped on these beams and made this by hand, one brick at a time, and made these perfect, you know, spheres, you know, and they made this. And all of a sudden started realizing, you know, the true power of actually having this, this um, approach to cultural sustainability, but kind of um, heritage, you know, not only does it not shackle you, but actually allows you to create something much more powerful than what you would normally, you know. And it, it, we started realizing that there was this wealth of skill you know, for example, in Niger, we don't, we cannot use wood because it's a desert country. So we use a lot of recycled metal, and we have people who are really skilled at soldering. And they do, you know, they make all kinds of, you know, they make shacks, they make doors, they make, you know, all kinds of things. So then it became an exercise of trying to figure out how do we use these basic skills that they have, whether they're the masons or the metal workers or artisans, and then amplify that. And then how do we use something simple like just, you know just bars of recycled metal and turn them into things like these, right? And these were all done by local masons and, and fabricators. But then the other aspects, you know, that we encountered on this project, again, which, is, which speaks to the cultural um, sustainability, is the fact that 
you know, it was very controversial. It's a controversial project because we were taking a mosque that we were proposing to turn into a library. So obviously we had to have discussions in terms of whether this was appropriate or not, whether this was blasphemous or not, you know, which was also incredibly enriching because then we, can, we could point to, you know, aspects of the religion that actually, you know, talk about the importance of knowledge and how sacred, you know, that pursuit of knowledge is and how actually this is perfectly in keeping with traditions of Islam from its early, you know, from its early days, which was an enlightening moment for everyone. But then it really allowed us to create, you know, a kind of negotiating space, you know, from one, from one to the other, where the fact that we had these two spaces, a library and learning center next to a mosque, you know, with just a garden between them, created this movement within the project where, because you have to pray five times a day, you go from the library to the mosque and back, and psychologically that barrier between that secular knowledge and that religious practice starts breaking away, right? Because now all of a sudden it becomes benign. All of a sudden you don't have this tension, you know, this kind of impression that somehow one is violating the other. And for us that was also a discovery and incredibly empowering. And if I can... Um, but I think the biggest takeaway, you know, for, from this project, like I said, was this collaboration that we had with the traditional, you know, um, makers and started realizing that when they were done with that project, they were so incredibly proud of what they produced. It stretched their abilities and their skills so far beyond anything they thought they could do that we started looking for more ways to do this because it really became clear that a lot of this, a lot of what we do, a lot of our impulse to go and just copy elsewhere has to do with a lack of confidence. That's really all it is. It's not because we don't have the skills. It's not because, you know, as, as designers, we can imagine anything. So then if we know, we know the skills that are available, then we can make them do anything, really. And so, we worked, um, we, were, we were doing this project for a, a, a space um, for artisans um, in Niger, that they would have kind of a market space slash public space for, for the city. And so we were invited um, to, to exhibit it at the, Venice, at the current Venice Biennale and thought that this would be the perfect project to showcase. But then what was really important for me was to include the artisans in the fabrication of the installation itself in Venice. So that once again, we could design something that, something that could be part of the exhibition that they made with their own hands, that everybody would kind of come in contact with. And, but that could, again, be amplified. That would have nothing to do with what they're used to making. They make furniture with this kind of technique, for example, with this embossed leather, um, whether it's you know, furniture or like doors every once in a while. But then we turn, you know, this is the project. Um, rather than focusing on the project for the Benali, we decided to mo mostly make the whole installation about them and the way they work and the things that they produce and to really show off their skill, right? And the model is just kind of like this little thing on the side and that's, you know, the only thing. But really, the whole exhibition is about what they can do. And it's about these materials also that we use and this kind of the power of it and what you can do with it. You know, when they, we, we shared these images with them and they were just incredibly shocked, actually, because we just asked them to make these individual tiles, you know, made out of leather, that they weren't really understanding how we were going to use. And then when we sent them the pictures, when we have these four meter high, you know, um, fins that were clad with their leather tiles, it was kind of a revelation. And it was also a moment of, oh, so like, this is in Venice, in Italy, yes. And for me, the importance is really, again, for us as designers to find opportunities, to find ways to take all of us out there in the world, right? Rather, again, always being the recipient of something, but then really, you know, showing, proving to ourselves too, right? At the end of the day, we're also a little bit shaky. Um, that not only do we have a lot to offer, but at the same, you know, um, what do you call it? At the same, to the same level as anybody else, I guess, in a way. You know, it's just different at the end of the day. 
And so carrying on, you know, another project where we explored similar things, um, and you will see a thread here, we explored the same thing over and over again, was this um, market um, that we built in, um, in Niger still. And so this was the, the old market that was kind of falling apart. I mean, it's a weekly market where the village was really interested in having a permanent market, you know, for, to sustain its local economy. And it was a very simple, you know, market with just, you know, just um, mud walls and, you know, patch um, flat roofs. Um, but that required a lot of maintenance. But that also, as a daily market, was just really difficult um, to deal with. So it was really important to come up with something different. But one of the things about this market, even though it was just kind of, you know, scattered like that, there was this tree in the middle that was incredibly important to, to the village. Um, and that was one of the public spaces of the village, actually. So on market day, people would always, you know, um, congregate around it. They would sell, they would have snacks. And that was, it was almost like an open air restaurant in some way. So it kind of gave us the starting point, you know, again, kind of understanding the place, understanding the culture, the habits, you know, um, what is it that's important to this place, the narrative of this market then led us to just do something that really stayed within the realm of how they already used the space, right? With elevating the place of the street even more and really kind of creating a space that, um, that children could use to play and, you know, people could sit around and maybe you could even have functions and maybe you could have all kinds of cultural events, you know, going on, but still keeping within the language of the original market with these, you know, instead of mud walls, now we're using compressed earth bricks and we're using a bit of cement, you know, on the top to protect it. That way we just never have to touch this again. And it can just stay like that. And then, you know, because again, this is the desert, unfortunately we couldn't plant trees because there isn't enough water um, to grow them. So then it was about, again, using our metal workers to create these metal, recycled metal structures that would, you know, um, provide shade but also provide ventilation, um, provide an element of whimsical, of course, also. You know, it's very playful. Children love it. Um, and it ended up becoming this, um, not only public space, but it became the recess spot because there was a middle school across the street and every recess, all of the children just invaded the market, which was quite a surprise. We did not realize that. And this is basically where they hang out. Um, so, I mean, it, like I said, it's just kind of this very simple um, structure ju that just tries to accommodate everything that they can possibly need in very neat, you know, modules. Um, but then using the metal, you know, rather than, you know, so, because metal attracts heat, obviously. So it was this whole exercise of trying to figure out how high these metal disks needed to be in order to not bring heat down to the people below them, but then staggering them also so that it facilitates ventilation between them. So when you're underneath, there's actually a breeze that happens, you know, um, especially, and when you line them up one after another, then the breeze is just kind of this continuous. It's almost like you're under this canopy that has a fan on it. Um, so that was also quite a discovery, you know, in the end, because this is a lot of it, a lot of what we do, I feel, is there's a lot of theory at work. I was like, okay, let's try. And then usually we're lucky enough that it works. Um, but, but when it doesn't, I mean, we do a lot of prototyping in-house as well. So we build these things um, in our office, actually in our office backyard to test it out um, and to see if it's structurally sound to make sure that, you know, what we're talking about in terms of the, the, the breeze and all that actually happens, stand underneath it and, you know, does it get hotter actually when you're underneath it or is it cooler, et cetera, et cetera. So we test these things out a lot. It, it becomes a very involved process. But not only, not only does this speak to um, cultural sustainability, but also for this project, it was very much about economic sustainability. So it was about the economic sustainability of this village, but you know, the economic sustainability of building you know, a, a, a project like this, because just like the previous project, one of the challenges that we had was proposing you know, something that would be cheaper than any other alternative that was being presented. So for example, for the, for the community center and mosque project, we were able to build it for less than what the original, for, I mean the whole complex, for less than how much they had been quoted for just the mosque alone, right? 
but the entire project, including additional classrooms, which I haven't shown and all that, still came back to cheaper because of the local materials approach, because of you know, using local masons, et cetera, et cetera. And same thing for, for this market, where we, were, you know, we had a budget to build 30 different um, stalls, and we were able to deliver 52 of them for the same, you know, for the same amount, thinking that the, mar the market would grow eventually into it. But then we were surprised to find out on, on opening day, which is here, um, every single stall was taken because what happened was that people watched it being built from other villages and everybody, now even the main town to the region comes on Fridays to sell at this market, which again now is starting to create something of a boost economically for you know, um, the village itself. Oops. Oh, sorry, I was just going backwards. <laughs> yeah. So, when, another thing that goes along the, the lines of economic sustainability was that, you know, obviously when you, often, when you talk about local materials, we always like to relate them to villages. Like it's something, oh, like you can do mud, you know, it's a village. Or you can do earth bricks because it's a village. But for us, and this is a project I'm not showing for the first time, but um, the very first project you know, I ever developed in Niger was made out of earth, but it was in the city. And that is the challenge, right? It's just kind of the understanding that these systems, you know, these building systems, these materials are actually appropriate anywhere. It's not something that is about a village. It's, not, it's just a different material. It would be as, to me, it's as flabbergasting as saying that wood only belongs in a village. Why? Because it's not as durable as concrete or resistant as concrete. That doesn't make sense. So why does earth somehow, you know, because it's not the same kind of maintenance, it's not the same kind of, um, kind of hands-off material, somehow is inferior. Um, so this is a project that we're working, that we're building right now in Niger, which is an office building. Um, can you? which is an office building um, that is the first one um, out of um, compressed earth bricks hybrid system, you know, with concrete, uh, that this, the same system we did um, for the mosque project. And essentially for this project, it was all about economics. It was, you know, the client wanted a, like a real, you know, just like a serious building, but oh, what happened? But um, for us, it was about how do we go about making a building that is affordable from a construction point of view, so we use earth bricks instead of cement bricks. But then the biggest issue for office buildings is actually long term. It's the maintenance, it's the heating, I mean the cooling. So the heat in a country where it's 45 degrees, um, where you need natural light, but then every time you have a window, it just, you know, it's like a, a heat sink, right? and all, everything you're going to spend in air conditioner and makes a massive difference. So for us, it became this project that, where the entire shape of the project concerned itself with keeping the building cooler, with protecting from the heat. So, you know, just kind of having as little openings as possible, but whenever you do, you actually shy away from the sun and create all kinds of different mechanisms and systems to keep um, the interior as cool as, as, as possible. And so then all of this, in a way, culmin, cul kind of leads to, I can't find the word now in English, um, leads to this other project um, that is going under construction in Niger in a couple of months, um, which is a cultural center um, that assembles everything that I've been talking about, both in terms of you know, environmental sustainability, economic sustainability, cultural sustainability, where um, it's a project that looks to the local architecture history, but also looks to the, um, the climate in a very, very serious way, both in terms of the shape that it uses, in terms of the spaces that it produces, in terms of how it seeks to stretch Again, the skills of local masons, um, local builders, keeping in mind that we just always use actually very traditional forms, but again, you know, because of the scales that we use, because of the way that we put them together, we can then create new types of expressions, new kinds of um, 
interpretations. But then looking at you know local habits, you know this is this was a site where there was a lot of urban agriculture, for example, which is something that's really hot in the West, and everybody's talking about how we need to do urban ag agriculture. But in a lot of African cities, we do that just naturally, you know, just kind of everywhere, especially if it's a river city, or you know you have a plot of land somewhere, you know that sits empty. You ask the owner, you know, can I plant some beans or something like that, and it's kind of a sustenance, right? So the building then, rather than you know. We, we see green roofs everywhere. You know, we see green roofs in, in other countries and all that. But it's like, well, what if we actually start re, re incorporating these cultural habits that we have rather than always fighting them and thinking that certain things are appropriate but not others. And you can't, you know, you can't just have just anybody just come up on this roof and you know, plant you know, whatever they want to plant and do whatever they want to do. But then the question is, why not? What is, what it, where are these rules? you know, that we're imposing on ourselves for really no reason other than that sensation of somehow, you know, feeling more evolved, <laughs> quote unquote, based on, based on someone else's, sorry, can you play? Based on someone else's idea uh, of what spaces should look like. So really this, this project concerned itself with you know, creating public spaces, creating openness, you know, so that um, the building would be accessible to anybody, even if they're not going inside of it. But then really taking, you know, both the exterior and the interior seriously. So you have these towers who, that allow you to collect water, that allow, you know, agriculture, that allow, um, that allow um, you know, dwelling you know at the base of them because they create enough shade um, that it feels like you have just this perpetual canopy at any given moment during the day you know um, these squares inside are always shaded but it was really also about acknowledging the fact that you know big buildings like you know big cultural centers and museums and all that can be pretty intimidating so it was really a question of figuring out how do you make a building that is part of the city that people can encounter in a very casual way and traverse in a very casual way and don't necessarily need to feel the pressure of engaging directly with, but that actually if they spend enough time hovering around it, eventually they probably will engage with. So it's about also the gentleness with which we can provide spaces and the gentleness with which um, we need to, I guess, guide or, you know, as designers, not so much guide, but um, how familiar, I guess, we can allow people to be with the spaces that we propose, but then how familiar the insides are and work in such a way that you really feel like you belong because of the way it feels, because of the way the forms are, because of the architectural language that is being used, and that all of a sudden now this is actually really part of you. It's not about something else or some other system, you know, out there. And so one of, one of the challenges, um, and I'm almost done, one of the challenges, um, one of the questions I've had was to try to figure out, is this something, you know, this approach, is this something that's more of an African approach, or is this something that is kind of universal? Because I like to think that it's just a fundamental approach to building and a fundamental approach to architecture, right? Where you concern yourself with the local conditions, with, you know, what the local, what, whoever is going to use the building needs. Who are the people who will be using it? What are the challenges that you're trying to tackle? And then build to that. Um, and so now that we're, we're working outside of Niger and also outside of the continent, it's been really fascinating um, to use the exact same principles and somehow, you know, <laughs> still make architecture. Um, so we did this proposal for the National Black Theatre in New York. Um, and um, it was really about, for, uh, for me, um, thinking about it, it was really about, again, trying to figure out, okay, who is this space for? You know, it's for, this, it, this is, was the very first black theater that, you know, really showcased um, black plays that would not be played anywhere else, you know, in New York. Um, it nurtured so many, you know, artists and, and um, had, did so much for the black community, you know, in New York. And so what does this mean, you know, and what is, you know, this black condition um, in that context? You know, and one of the things 
that we kept going back to, or in my mind that kept coming back, was just like really being black in America, you know, unlike in Africa, it's really a story of triumph over adversity, right? You know, it, it was just kind of tapping into this resilience and this, you know, looking at things like the slave cabin and actually starting to see that a lot of it reminds me of some of African architectural languages, you know, with the rhythms, you know, and these um, kind of patterned um, surfaces, um, very similar to the way we, we did it, but, you know, looking at what's the local material, you know, the wood, What's the, you know, this is not a place for mud, obviously, this is not a place for earth, but wood is that material. And then starting to imagine interiors that go, you know, that explore that form in a completely different way because this was an interior project, not, you know, it was not for a building, it was for taking the sh a shell of a building and creating the space, you know, molding the space inside. So starting to think about how the wood can be used just like we use um, earth bricks, so in a structural way, instead of just as a cladding, just structural wood, which would have all kinds of implications in terms of the sound, in terms of, you know, kind of the, the atmosphere that you can create, in terms of really starting to... I, I would imagine even the smell, <laughs> you know, inside of the building, right? You know, how how it all feels, but then the scale is obviously completely different from, you know, a slave cabin or anything like that, or, or, or a cabin somewhere in the south, you know, of the United States. But it was really about tapping into both that pain of the history and of the trajectory um, of a people, but then, you know, taking that, taking that resilience and making it soar in a way, and really imagining new spaces that could envelop you in such a way and envelop you in the way that I often seek to do even in projects that I do, you know, in Niger, you know, and elsewhere. But at the end of the day, really, you know, I think at this point I'm realizing that the work for me has really been about, you know, what is the truth of a place? At the end of the day, that's really all it's about. You know, I feel like we often maybe as, as designers overcomplicate things, you know, when we, we worry so much about styles and, you know, schools of thoughts, you know, and, and obviously, you know, what I'm saying also is a school of thought, I'm, you know, obviously, but, you know, sometimes it's just as simple as just asking the basic questions, you know, of a place, you know, and getting down to the DNA, really, of where you are and what you need to build for and build to. So I'll keep it there. Thank you so much for listening. Well, if you were a ballet dancer, we'd be saying, come and take a bow, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I'm going to open this up to the audience. We've got about 15 minutes for, for questions, but I, I just wanted to, to start by saying, every time I hear you talk and I, I, I see your work, I think to myself, that's exactly how it should be. I think that so. there's a kind of rightness mm. about the forms, about the materials, about the smell. There's a kind of rightness about your process. Mm. And I just want to ask if that came later in your work mm. or did you always know that this is exactly the right form for, for the idea that I'm trying to express? Mm. No, I'm always looking for the rightness. That's the thing. I'm kind of obsessed with it. So that's what the whole process of every single project is about. And I keep doing it and I throw away so many ideas until it feels right. So I guess my approach is not so much, you know, oh, I have an idea. This is cool. I'll do it. Um, it's always been about, well, is this correct? Is actually the word I always use in my head. Is this correct? Is this the right? Does this feel right? And often it doesn't in the beginning. It almost never does in the beginning. So you have to keep refining it. You have to keep digging deeper. You have to keep, and then things kind of start adding to it. And that's why often our projects also are incredibly layered. They always do so many different things. It's not just the environmental part. It's not just that it's harvesting water. It's not just that it's creating, you know, culturally, you know, um, appropriate spaces. It's all of that. And it's because of that process of just trying to find 
the correct, what a correct way, because there are multiple correct ways, right? But just one that seems right for the place, for the use, for the stories, for the narratives of a place, and that can really make a contribution to those narratives, you know? Yeah, I think it's a really profound statement. I mean, I think over the past few years, every time I've been on a jury or adjudicating a competition, mm -hmm. Maybe 10 or 15 years ago, you would think about the end result. You'd be looking at the building. Now people mm -hmm. are actually much more talking about the process. Yes. You know, how does the process make this happen? Well, for me, it's much more satisfying, actually. The process is what I'm in this for. Actually. I never, I, the thing that excites me the most is launching on a project that I have no idea what it's going to look like. I don't have the answer. And usually when I feel like I do, it's not very interesting, right? It, but then I know if I don't, there's just this long process to look forward to. And that process is incredibly fascinating. We spend a huge amount of time in research mm -hmm. before starting a project. I mean, probably too much, mm -hmm. right? But because I don't see where else the ideas should come from if it's not from that research. Because otherwise, then again, how do you get to the correct solution if that preliminary work is not done? And that work is in every way from history to, you know, architecture of the place to, you know, what are the socio-economic, you know, forces at play? What are the political forces at play? What are, you know, what do people care about? You know, what do they do in the morning? And it, can, it, it goes from the most profound to the most banal and all of it matters because you don't know which one of those things actually ends up floating to the surface. And, and actually most of the time it's all of those things that come together and guide your intuition, ultimately. At least that's how I think it should be. Yeah, it works. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to open this up to the um, audience. Have we got any questions from people in the audience? Hello, this is, um, it's been amazing. Thank you. It's, it just fits everything that we as Africans are supposed to do. Oh, thank you. You know, think and work through our inner being, uh, what we have. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to find out whether on your projects, the same method that you use in research and things you use in the interiors mm -hmm. to finish off the buildings, the projects. Do you actually finish them off with the interiors yourself? Yes, of course. I mean, it depends on the projects. And I guess maybe it depends also what you mean by interiors, right? But, um, but it all depends on the project. So, we, for example, we don't do many residential projects where the interiors might be, you know, something else. But because we do more cultural projects or public projects, then the interior architecture is also our, our concern. Um, and it is the same thing for all of that, you know, because, again, you have to think about the materials. You have to think about, you know, the right fit. So we often have problems, something very simple. We can never find the proper light fixtures that we want. Um, so often we end up, you know, I remember the very first project we ever did. It was a series of six homes. And for the life of me, I could not find just very plain, simple, rectangular light fixtures anywhere on the market in Niger. And so we just designed this metal, you know, like sconces and that we just had our metal workers make. And we put a bulb behind and those were the sconces for, you know, because again, it has to feel right for the project. If it's not correct for the, for the expression of that project, then it doesn't belong there. So we do have to think about that, so definitely. Thank you. Yeah. I am coming from the background of um, an educator. And so when I look at something like this, I'm wondering, how do we um, bring this into the classroom? How much of this is about how you were educated, you know? And how do we sort of... Um, inspire another generation of you know, young architects to begin to think more seriously about these questions? No, excellent question. Thank you for that. Um, and that is something that I've been talking about a lot and thinking about actually recently um, more and more. Because I started realizing that part of what explains the way I think is also the way I was educated. I was in, the way I was educated in the environment in which I grew up. I was incredibly fortunate to grow up in the middle of the desert. It doesn't sound fortunate, but it was. Um, and to grow up near a medieval town from the 15th century, where I could see a local architecture that was still being lived in. But then also I went to the local public schools, right? And so, you know, in history class, you know, and all of that, like I studied our history 
and it was all the different empires and the Ghana Empire and you know and the Mali Empire and the Songhai Empire, all of that, you know. And so when I went to the U.S. to study and realized that actually even history is incredibly subjective, and even the arc of history that I was familiar with vanished completely when I went to another context, and now all of a sudden. Somehow everything is about the Renaissance, and the classical period is Rome. And the thing is, I know that that's just not true, because I was fortunate enough to have had actually a, a different history、um, background and different sets of references. And so the problem that we have is that post-colonization, what we did is that we took all of the education system. From my previous masters, and just to them, oops, and transplanted them. It means that the areas that we study, it's you know, like the geographies that we study are their geographies, the histories that we study are their histories. So how can we make something that is relevant to us? That's not possible. So I think, you know, this is something that has to happen internally from our point of view to just. Really, be focused like a laser beam, you know, in a way, to who we are, you know, because that's really the the heart of the problem. And then to really building that confidence, and I think knowing more about who we are built for me. I know that's what did it. I know that I was never, you know, I never bought into.、Um, I, I, I would I would be taught about the great. Modernist masters, right? That's what you're taught, you know, in architectural school. But me, what I saw was that actually this is just like the architecture from the desert. These cubes, you know, that someone would come and tell me, "Oh yeah, this is Bauhaus architecture." I was like, "No, this is actually desert architecture," right? So then you you start realizing that first of all, they didn't invent anything, <laughs> actually, no matter what they say. Um, and second of all, there's there's a wealth of references out there that we're just not tapping into, and we're all the poorer for it. The whole world is the poorer for it because now the whole world just looks one way, which is really unfortunate, you know, when you think about just the wealth of, you know, everything that's out there. So it, it's really at the end of the day about pushing this knowledge of self, pushing, you know, our Our narratives, our histories, you know, to the forefront. Not to say that the other ones are not valid, but this, this, this is in addition to, and that's not just for us. It's really for the rest of the world too, you know. About really, and I remember saying once that, you know, you cannot really imagine, you know, a correct future for yourself if your idea of your past is completely erroneous. That's true for us, but that's also true even for the Western world. The way that they think of themselves is actually not the truth. It is a narrative, you know, a narrative where they're the center center of the universe, and the narrative that all of us are buying into. But it has nothing to do with the actual truth of who we all are. So I just wanted to ask,、uh, projects in the village. You probably didn't have to do this, but in this era. Priority is、um, associated with earth. How were you able to convince your clients to use earth as a、mm. material for your cultural center, which is in the city?、Yes. Let me say more. Actually, most of our projects are in the city.、Um, yeah, and so one thing again,、um, money is powerful. Because the thing is, you can't just say use this; it's better, it's more, you know, appropriate, it's more, you know, that's that's compelling. That's that's one aspect. The other argument that we really push is the economic one. Architecture is incredibly expensive, so you need to be able to demonstrate that you can build it cheaper, which we've proved. But then, obviously, you also need to prove the kind of integrity of the material. You can't just ask people to just jump in. With you, you know, just oh, trust me, it will work. So we're incredibly rigorous in the process of brick production. We do all kinds of, you know, tests, crush tests, structural tests, all kinds of things. When we're as we're working on projects, the batches of bricks get tested in labs, the national labs of the country, and to just make sure that, you know, 
the clients are reassured. But even before we get to that, because then they have to be convinced, right? One thing that tends to happen is that I don't really ever try to push it. The clients come into our office and the bricks are everywhere, you know, and, you know, we have kind of like a play area outside where we make structures and you know experimentations and things like that you know out of the breaks you know and they're naturally curious about it and they ask us questions so we wait they ask us the questions and we answer and usually i mean even for the office building that i just showed you the client walked in and directly told me listen this will be a concrete building and i said no problem you you know it's your project we can make a good a good you know we can still make a good building but then through the process of talking through the project and also coming in contact with this material more and more, because at the end of the day, it's about just, you just don't know, right? You want what you know. It's normal. And you can only imagine what you know. But the more in contact, you know, we came, the more we talked about it, the more questions she had, the more comfortable she became. And we designed the project. And then I think on the very last presentation, when we finished talking, she said, you know, I think we're going to do this with Earth. And I was even more shocked than her, <laughs> right? But again, you know, it, it just, it's not about punctifying. It's not about being on your pulpit and just saying, this is the correct way, you know, I'm right. And you don't know, you know, like you need, you need to be enlightened. It's not about that. You have to respect where people are coming from. You have to respect their fears, you know, which of course they have those fears because all of us have been conditioned to believe that these materials are not good. So then it's our job to figure out ways to gently, you know, navigate that territory. Yeah. So we've got one more question over here. Yeah. You know, you started off uh, considering sustainability and it's been very interesting how we are using old methods, existing uh, materials. I wonder what your thoughts are on going to scale in a sense of up overturning the system. Hmm. We've got certain practices in architecture, in construction and so on. Do you ever dream of taking over? Do you ever dream that your methods may become mainstream and common currency? Wow. <laughs> I would say that any one of us who wishes to do anything differently does dream that whatever it is that they're thinking about becomes, because otherwise we wouldn't be doing it, right? That becomes, you know, common currency. But I think ultimately it's really more about, you know, knowing whether you're putting something of value on the table and consistently doing so, you know, without necessarily focusing on, oh, is everybody doing it? You know, if everybody is not doing it, then it's a failure. Or if everybody is not doing it, it's not so much about that. I think it's also about leaving the traces of something else, of something different. That, you know, can always be tapped even later. You know, in a way, you're kind of leaving a marker of something, a possibility on the table. And I think that's all we can do, you know. All we can do is explore the possibilities and give them our all. You know, of course we hope that they, they get, you know, the, the, they, they get amplified, you know, by, by duplication, you know, and all of those things. But that's a long process. You know, it's not something that happens overnight and it's not something that, I don't think it's not something that one should set out for necessarily. But it's really more about, you know, staying true to a conviction and seeing it through. I don't know about the rest of the audience, but I feel both moved and inspired, which I do every time you talk. Um, and I think events like this are, are really important. I mean, you know, somebody asked the question about education, and education for sure is the curriculum. It's the stuff that you learn in school. It's the relationship that you have with your teachers or your professors. But there's another side to education that's just the possibility to hear something different. And I, I couldn't be prouder that this was the inaugural event. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.